Hi, I'm Pastor Jill, and on behalf of Pastor Jerry and myself and all of our friends and family at Hillcrest Church, we welcome you to our worship service this morning. So whether you found us online, whether you knew we were going to be here, we are so excited that you're here. And if you're new here, we are so glad that you've joined us. And some of the next steps, if you're interested, is we'd like to get to know you. So please jump on our website. I believe it's www.hillcrestmethodistorg.org. And you can either get my email address or you can get my cell phone. Reach out to me and uh, let's start a conversation. Again, we're so happy that you're here. So one of the questions um, that I had asked this week is, you know, Pastor Jill, we're living into our new vision about Hillcrest as being the blessing place. What does that mean? And I looked up the word blessed, and I had to remember that blessed means taking somebody to a higher level. So I'm going to think about it as if you're feeling blessed, you're getting closer to God. So whether it's an activity or a scripture reading or a conversation, if we say we want to bless you through any of those means, we want to bring you to a higher place and closer to God. So with that, we're so excited that you joined us, and let's begin our service.
As we come together today in this trying world, let us take our thoughts and needs and desires to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come to you today, the words of one of the Psalms comes to mind. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. In these worrisome, difficult, and stressful times, how can we not praise you for your presence in this world, in our lives? Just knowing that you are here, watching over us, guiding us, protecting us, loving us, blessing us, helps us through those troublesome, trying times. We give thanks and praise you, our Lord, for this comfort. We give thanks for all those care providers and other medical workers who are endangering and at times sacrificing their lives, physical health, their mental health, or a normal existence to aid us through this pandemic. Love them, Lord. Bless them, Lord. We give thanks for all those that are working hard to maintain the businesses that supply our basic needs, our food, our employment, our necessary services such as utilities, repairs, personal needs. Love them. Bless them, Lord. We give thanks that you've made us leave our past and force us to rise above those past times and become more loving, more considerate, more caring beings. Love us, Lord. Bless each of us, Lord. Overcome our stubbornness, our selfishness, our self-centeredness, Lord. Help us to respond to those problems we face today with determination and courage, while always remembering to respond as you wish, not what we wish. During this covert pandemic, help us to obey the common sense that you've given each of us, rather than follow our own selfish, self-centered desires. At times, this is extremely hard to do, Lord. Forgive us when we falter along the way. Help us to give more of ourselves to others, Lord, offering words of encouragement, material possessions, and comfort to those in need. Help us to be grateful for these new experiences brought into our lives by those around us, Lord rather than bemoan and complain about what we can no longer enjoy. Let our gratitude multiply, spreading to others. As we look around, most of what we see is not the world that you would want for us, Lord. Work through us. Help us to be examples, influence others, leading others to you deepen our love for you and for the people around us. These are trying and stressful times for many, Lord. This covert pandemic has stretched many of us to our limits. There are also many here and their friends that have health problems, financial problems, family problems, other problems. At times that list can appear endless to us. Send your comforting Holy Spirit, your peace, and your calming presence to all those here and those in need or those without hope. Please be with each one of us. We so desperately need your presence and guidance in our lives. Comfort us. Love us. 
Bless us, Lord. Amen. Almighty and loving God, as we continue our journey to become a blessing place, help us to seek you. Help us to listen and hear your voice and be guided by the Holy Spirit. Remind us that you are our North Star, who will lead us through the desert and rough waters if we only put our trust in you. No mountain is too high or pandemic too big for us to overcome as we travel for, to, and with you. Please bring us closer to you on our journey. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and leave us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given. Jesus Christ, His Son, give thanks with a grateful heart, give thanks to the Holy One, give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ, His Son. King's Gate used to honor him by bowing down and kneeling before Haman. That's what the king had commanded. 
except Mordecai. Mordecai wouldn't do it, wouldn't bow down and kneel. The king's servant at the king's gate asked Mordecai about it. Why do you cross the king's command? Day after day they spoke to him about this, but he wouldn't listen. So they went to Haman to see whether something should be done about Mordecai had told them that he was a Jew. When Haman saw for himself that Mordecai didn't bow down and kneel before him, he was outraged. Meanwhile, having learned that Mordecai was a Jew, Haman hated to waste his fury on just one Jew. He looked for a way to eliminate not just Mordecai, but all Jews throughout the whole kingdom of Xerxes. In the first month, the month of Nisan, on the twelfth year of Xerxes, the purr, that is the lot, was cast under Haman's charge to determine the propitious day and month. The lot turned up the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar. Haman then spoke with King Xerxes. There is an odd set of people scattered throughout the provisions of your kingdom who don't fit in. Their customs and ways are different from those of everybody else. Worse, they disregard the king's law. They're an affront. The king shouldn't put up with them. If it places the king, let orders be given that they be destroyed. I'll pay for it myself. I'll deposit 375 tons of silver in the royal bank to finance the operation. The king slipped his signet ring off his hand and gave it to Hanan, son of Hamadash the Agagite, arch enemy of the Jews. Go ahead, the king said. It's your money. Do whatever you want with those people. The king's secretaries were brought in on the thirteenth day of the first month. The orders were written out word for word as Haman had addressed them to the king's satraps. The governors of every province and the officials of every people, they were written in the script of each province and the language of each people in the name of King Xerxes and sealed with his royal signet ring. Bulletins were sent out by couriers to all the king's provinces with orders to massacre, kill, and eliminate all of the Jews. Youngsters and old men, women and babies, on a single day, the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, the month Adar, and to plunder their goods. Copies of the bulletins were to be posted in each province, publicly available to all peoples to get them ready for that day. All the king's commands, the couriers took off the orders, was also posted in the palace complex of Susa. The king and Haman sat back and had a drink while the city of Susa reeled from the news. Oh my gosh, the plot thickens. Haman has convinced King Xerxes to kill, actually to annihilate all the Jews, and this would have included the Jews in Israel as well. It was to happen almost one year from the date of the edict from the king. Plenty of time for God to intervene. Actually, more time than God really needed. God only needed a nanosecond, but Haman gave God a year. So, we have a story of a man whose ego is so big and whose self-confidence is so low that he feels he needs to have everybody killed who doesn't think, act, and believe like he does. And subsequently, they won't bow down to him either. 
It wasn't just Mordecai he hated, he hated all the Jews. You see, Haman was a descendant from the Amalekites, who were ancient arch enemies of the Israelites. So this hatred had been going on for centuries. Haman is a man who wants to perpetuate that hatred, carries a lot of prejudice. He hated a group of people because of their differences in belief and culture. And certainly we still have some of that hate going on today. Look at the Middle East. Look at how some people detest what Black Lives Matter actually stands for. Look at the mosque bombings right here in the Twin Cities. Or the white supremacy groups we keep seeing on television. I'd like you to take a moment for some self-reflection. I'd like you to think of some of the prejudices that you've passed down in your family. Have you broken the link of these prejudices or are you just perpetuating them into the next generation? And if you are perpetuating them, are you ready to give them up to God? I remember the first time I told my mom that I was a dating a man that I suspected my folks wouldn't be really excited about. When I told my mom he was black, she said, well, at least he isn't Jewish. She really said that. <laughs> and I thought to myself, okay, there's some kind of pecking order here. Really, black is better than Jewish? Well, it was for our family at that time. And what is this piece about Haman stepping into God's shoes? He judges the Jews as being unacceptable and plans to annihilate them. I'm thinking judging sounds like a full-time job. After all, you have to check out all the facts, then you gotta fact check again, then you gotta talk to people, then you gotta do research, then you gotta fact check again, and then you make the judgment call. I think I'd prefer to leave that judgment to God. How about you? Or do you catch yourself judging the Somali woman in line having a challenge with her credit card? Do you catch yourself judging the old couple who can't seem to get their car parallel parked correctly? Do you catch yourself judging the police for some action they took or some action they didn't take? Or do you find yourself judging your kids or your spouse for the way they're spending money? I remember a great story. I had a Bible study partner and she always told this great story. She was sitting on an airplane in the aisle seat the window seat was filled, but the center seat in between them was empty. And she was really hoping that that center aisle or that center seat would remain empty so that she could stretch out during the flight, put her bag up there, kick her feet back. Then sure enough, right before the plane door closed, down comes walking this big old fat Harley dude. He heads right to her row and says, excuse me, ma'am, I have that center seat. She thought, oh great, I gotta deal with him the whole flight. So the dude sits down, unpacks all of his stuff, gets his seatbelt on and pulls out his book. The book was the Bible. End of that story. So it seems in our story, like the nasty Haman has won the plan that has been created. The, the plan that the king has signed off on without doing any fact checking, he must totally trust Haman. The edict is brought forward and the Jews learn that they have about one year to live. And man, that really begs the question that I wonder about. What do you think you would do if you knew the exact date 
of the death of yourself, your family, and all your friends. Would you give up the ship now and turn into a repressed and depressed recluse? Would you convene with family and friends and try to figure out a way around the verdict? Would you hit the ground on your knees and thank God and ask God for wisdom? Well, to be truthful, we'd all probably do a little of the first two. But hopefully as Christ followers, we turn to God for guidance. For guidance on a way to change the verdict or a way to accept our fate. Looking into God's eyes and looking to God to get us through those tough times. I just found out my best friend in the world, a friend of 45 years, has only a few more days to live. Her cancer was misdiagnosed and now has spread to her brain. When I heard the news, I began wailing. These horrible bellowing sounds coming from my body. My poor dogs didn't know what to do. They just surrounded me with their love. I called a few other friends, so distraught my words were barely audible. It's now probably been five hours since I heard this news, and by the time you see this, it'll have been three or four days, and my heart is still broken. I know God wants to comfort me because the first thing on my agenda this morning was to write the devotional and to get it emailed out to all of you. And on Wednesday, it was ministering to me in a very personal way, this devotional of thanksgiving, thanking God for all he's given me and is yet to give me. And knowing that he has Diane, my friend, and that he will continue comforting her and helping her to accept the inevitable. And maybe that's how the Jews felt in Esther's time. The end might be near, but God is nearer. God is closer. And he will comfort us. He will comfort you today. All you've got to do is ask. Amen. Go ye, go ye into the world and
benediction, Lord. We are so thankful for you and thankful for our beautiful weather. And those of us who have not had COVID, we are so thankful that you have kept us safe. Lord, we ask that you would shine your face on us and that you would bless us, which means take us all to a higher place so that we can experience your love, your joy, your mercy, and your forgiveness. Amen.